please stand for the reading of the word. <clears throat> Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. That is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. In the Old Testament book of Esther, incredible things happen in a brief 10 chapters. The Jewish people are threatened with extermination by an evil Hitler prototype, but through a series of remarkable circumstances are ultimately saved by a brave woman who had the courage to do what was right at the risk of her own life. There are lots of plot twists and strange coincidences and situations that only God could have arranged. But the interesting fact is this. He is never mentioned in the entire book of Esther. God is not mentioned at all. But it's obvious that his hand is at work behind the scenes orchestrating each and every dramatic turn of events. So too, the Holy Spirit is, in, is at work in all of Acts chapter 3, yet he's never mentioned so strange since in the previous chapter we, he was introduced with much fanfare. From him coming down and filling each believer in that upper room to the apostle Peter preaching the first Christian sermon to 3,000 people getting saved that day to the very first church fellowship. You can see the Holy Spirit working in that chapter. How curious then that the Holy Spirit is never mentioned at all in chapter 3, though his work is seen all through this account. But isn't that the way the Holy Spirit works in each one of us today? We can't feel his presence. We don't even know he's doing anything through us. But by faith, we are assured that he's with us as we go about each day as we live for the Lord. Amen? Verse 1. One, P one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Notice who God put together as a ministry team. Peter and John. You couldn't have paired two who were more opposite. Peter was the outgoing, gregarious one who Jesus was constantly rebuking. In fact, they said the only time Peter spoke, opened his mouth, was to insert his other foot. John was reflective and tender-hearted, the one whom Jesus loved and who leaned on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. So two complete opposites doing ministry together. They were as different as could be, kind of like every single married couple in this room. Have you noticed? You will see over time, Nathan and Mackenzie. Oh, we have all these things in common now. But wait, just you wait. Look at Josh looking at, oh, you're, you're shaking head no? Yes, yes, yeah, I know that, I know that. It's just the way God does it. He just does it that way. So they're as different as could be, but they were one in Christ. Oh, how God loves to mix his 
family together, corporate executives with ranchers, Texans with Californians, and realtors with more realtors. Think of all, for those of you who don't know, Carl, we have just like a whole ton of realtors in this church, okay? Think of all our differences, yet we come together each week to fellowship, to break bread, and we enjoy one another. It's as Casey was saying, you know, this is the highlight of the week. This gives us a charge for the rest of the week. This gives us an opportunity to set things right by putting God first. I love those of you who come early to the Sunday school. I love those of you who don't, but I love you more when you come to Sunday school. And you're getting that extra word in in the morning. And when you come on Wednesdays, uh, my, my hope and dream is one day that we're open seven days a week that there's always something going on here. That's how my old church was. It was seven days a week. We never closed, essentially. And it was a, a, kind of like Whataburger. We could be the spiritual Whataburger, right? So I would love that to happen, that we're always doing things. And people now are picking up ministries, doing things. We're being blessed by the hospitality committee with a free meal. Hey, free meals are always good, aren't they? Man, praise God for that. But think about our differences when we come together as one. Peter and John, before Christ rose, were simply disciples of Jesus. Now they are members of one common body. They're brothers. They were once friends, but now they're brothers. Now they're headed to the temple, but it's not on the Sabbath day, but on a regular day. Why is that important? The early church's idea of prayer and worship was not just a once-a-week event, but a daily lifestyle. That is what I am trying to inculcate in all of us here is to make the worship of God a daily lifestyle. Sometimes it's here at the church, but mostly it's got to be practiced in the home. And I'm formulating a plan for next year where every home will be a little church. And the heads of the home, whether they're single moms or whether they're the fathers of the family, that everyone, I want everyone to come together with their family so they can worship and put him first and raise them up. And I've got a, it's going to be several months in the making, but we went to that conference, didn't we? Faye and Dave. So we're looking into how that will work out. Now the time is 3 p.m. That's significant because it's after the daily sacrifice at the time of prayer. They didn't go to the daily sacrifice. Why? Because Jesus was the final sacrifice. He was all, that sacrifice was made when Jesus was crucified, so there was no need for them to attend that. But we see here now that the old ways of Judaism are starting to give way to the new ways of Christianity. So things are starting to change slowly, and the temple worship is starting to give way to Christian practice. Still, the apostles continued their habit of praying at this time in the afternoon. Jews prayed in the morning, the afternoon, and the evening. They prayed three times a day, and that was still their habit. And though they could pray anywhere, they believed, Jewish custom was this, that when they prayed in the temple, their prayers were twice as effective. Kind of interesting. Verse 2, Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. Now, beggars were a common fixture at the temple because they thought that as people came to worship God, those godly people would be more likely to give. Sadly, when godliness isn't growing in a society, beggars and homeless increase. This lame man positioned himself at a high traffic area at the gate called Beautiful, Now, there were 36 gates that surrounded the temple, nine on each side. And they were all beautiful, but this one was 75 feet tall and was covered in Corinthian brass along with silver and gold. We have an interesting contrast here. We have a marred man lying at a beautiful gate. Verse 3, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. One man said, and this is a, a man who's traveled around the world. He says, I've watched beggars in cities all over the world. They have a highly developed sense of who will respond. While walking down a street one day, he said, I spied a beggar at the end of the block, and I noticed his eyes darted from person to person as they passed by him, and he called out for a gift 
from only certain people. He could tell which ones were likely to stop. So usually if they see a guy from New Jersey, they're just going to pass by on that guy, right? Because they say, get out of here, right? <laughs> see, they see a wimpy Californian, they know they're an easy touch, right? Peter and John had passed by this beggar many times on his way to the temple. But why did they stop this time? What do you think? Why do you think they stopped this time? The Holy Spirit. Obviously, the unmentioned Holy Spirit stopped them because this was the beginning of a whole chain of God-arranged spiritual events. Sometimes we can get so preoccupied with our own agendas that we miss God's work right before our eyes. Right, we're going to get to this meeting, we've got to go to this place, but perhaps God may have a stop for you even today that you can reach out on behalf of Christ and touch somebody. Verses 4 and 5. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Now why would Peter command the man to look at him when he already had his attention? Well, obviously because beggars are already looking for the next handout and his eyes might have been wandering around looking for the next mark he could get. The man expected to get something and receive more than he could ever hope or imagine. With just one look, his eternal destiny changed from eternal punishment to eternal life. Verses 6 and 7. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Peter didn't interview the man. He didn't take the time to bond and empathize. No, he acted. He stepped out in faith, grabbed the man by the hand that was presumably outstretched looking for a handout, and he pulled the lame beggar up. He didn't have money, but he gave what was most important, the healing power of Jesus Christ. He was just doing what Jesus taught his disciples to do when he was with him. You remember in Luke 9, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. You know, we still have that power, don't you? We have that same power. I just lost my place, excuse me. I can't get back to it. Aren't you glad I have a backup? Oh my gosh, what page am I on? Six, thank you. Jesus called the 12 together and he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Christians, we always have something to give. Time, prayer, encouragement, the gospel, a helping hand, even money. Are we willing to use what we have? I went to a conference about two months ago, and it's called the Bless Conference. And it's how to bless everyone in the greater Austin area with the gospel. Y'all know that I, one of my gifting is an evangelist. But the times have kind of changed now. While I do believe giving people the word and giving them the straight gospel is effective, it's sowing seeds. But to get the people in our city interested, we're going to have to do something that's more relational. So I got this book called Bless, and I'm reading it now, and that's another thing that I'll be introducing next year about every, every one of us can reach every single person in Johnson City. We're going to pray for every single person in Johnson City 
by name. And that's another plan that we're working on. But right now I'm reading it and it told me to pray for my immediate neighbors. Now because I live out in the boondocks, my neighbors are here and over there, but I wrote down a little diagram, all the people around me, and I'm praying for them every day. And I also serve on the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Board of Directors, and I'm going to pray for everyone that I'm around there. And then I said, God, you know what? I want to reach our business community too. And I, there's a man named Kevin who owns A. Smith Galleries. And I hadn't seen him for a while. I said, Lord, I'm going to pray for Kevin today. He's politically opposite of me completely, but we've been friends, but I hadn't seen him for a while. I go, I'm going to pray for him today, and I'm going to stop by his gallery. I go, what would you have me say? And that's what the book says. Ask for what God would have you say. I don't forget what he told me, but I drove by, and there he is out front of his gallery with the other owner of the next gallery, Mark Smith. And I got out and I just said simply this. Are you ready? Write this down. Get your pens. Hey, how you doing? And I go, how, how y'all doing? We talked a little bit. I go, how can I pray for you? And said, pray for success. We used to have a vibrant <clears throat> art community. We had eight or nine galleries and now we're down to three. And they're bummed because these Art galleries are city art, I would say. He says, people come into our galleries, they want pictures of blue bonnets. <laughs> and he goes, we don't do that. And I said, okay. And then I learned from Mark that he's taking care of a friend of his who's ill and, and she's living in a room as he's tending to her. And I didn't pray for them there because they're not Christians. And I don't want to them to think I'm really weird, even though I am. I didn't want them to think it. Or I didn't want them to feel uncomfortable. So now, in the morning, I'm praying for those two. And I can't wait to go back. I said, I'm going to come back and check in on you guys. It was very friendly. We shook hands. And you know what else I said? Before I started the whole conversation, I said, Kevin, you know what? I'm sorry I got so political last year. And I know I said some things that might have been offensive. He didn't take any offense at all, and I, but I just felt it was necessary to cross that bridge. You, none of you can relate about that last year, can you? <laughs> so it was a good inroads, and I truly want to reach our whole city. And we've been praying for years that we would reach JC for JC, and I now believe we have a plan. So it'll be unveiled slowly next year, and every one of us has a part to play in this. Wouldn't that be awesome? if truly God starts a revival here in our little city. So I'm excited. So uh, if you get a chance and go by the art galleries and you see them outside, say, hey, how are you? We've been praying for you. Because we love you. Because we love you. We always have something to give. Time, prayer, the gospel. And if you need to, give people money. Right? People actually still need money. We can do that. There once was a starving man who came to a village but no one could spare a crumb of food for him at all. So he put a stone in water in a pot over a fire. Intrigued, the villagers watched him as he began to stir his soup. Eventually, one brings a couple of potatoes to add to the mix. Another had a few carrots. One person added an onion, another a handful of barley. One farmer donated some milk. Eventually, the stone soup became a tasty chowder, all because everyone had something to give. What has God given to you to help others for his glory? Every one of you has a spiritual gift. I know what most of your spiritual gifts are. Maybe you don't. Are you using them? We had a woman who came to this church for years. She doesn't come here any longer. And I said, you have the gift of mercy. She goes, huh? I go, everyone has a spiritual gift. You didn't know that? She goes, no, I've never heard of spiritual gifts. And she'd been a Christian her entire life. Every one of you has a gift. Every one of you has something to offer to this church and to the populace in general. Why? Because you're a Christian, 
You have the Holy Spirit in you, and he wants to work through you. Notice the healing was done in the name of Jesus Christ. It wasn't Peter's own power. It was in the name that is above every name. In the name, by the way, means in his authority, in his power, everything that Jesus is now and forever, and his name is to be used for his glory. When we pray in Jesus' name, we don't just tack it on on the end. Some people do, and I do. But when we're praying, we want to be sure that what we're praying is in his name, that what we are praying for is actually something he wants to do that we've prayed for. We're praying in Jesus' name, Saluna be healed. We're praying in Jesus' name, Krista be healed. We're praying in Jesus' name, the shoulders will be healed. We're praying in Jesus' name that Dave would be healed. We are praying this because we believe the mighty name of Jesus means something, and he heals today. Does he not? Have you been a recipient of his healing? Yes. Every time you are sick, you are healed. And you, we all had the worst sickness of all, we were dead in our sin and trespasses, headed for hell. But guess what he did? He reached down. He healed us with the saving name of Jesus Christ. You know, if an order is given in the name of the President of the United States, that order better be obeyed. When using the name of Jesus, there's a direct link between heaven and earth. It's not some sort of mystical can incantation or magic formula, but a recognition that if any miracles are to come, they come through the person and the name of Jesus Christ. I had an incredible experience using the name of Jesus when I was a new Christian and didn't know any better. I was running a singles ministry, and one of the women who uh, was related to someone who came wanted to get out of her abusive relationship with her boyfriend, but she was living with this guy. And so what we did is we planned a time that all of our team, about 10 of us, would go when the boyfriend was gone and we were going to move out all of this woman's belongings while the boyfriend was gone. So we were there. We were there an hour or so and we're packing things up and we're moving things out. And quite literally, I looked and I saw this shadow darkened the doorway and it was a big shadow and I looked and this guy was about six foot four and he showed up unexpectedly and we all go uh oh well he disappeared he comes back with a crossbow and he's loading it with an arrow and I said I didn't know what else to do I ran over and I go in the name of Jesus stop and you know what happened the guy did this started vibrating he dropped the bow and he fell down and we bailed out of that place. I, had never, I have never had that happen before th since then. But I learned later on, several years later, that the woman we were moving out became a Christian. The man that I said in the name of Jesus stopped, he became a Christian and they got married. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? So moms, when your little kid is acting up, you say, in the name of Jesus, stop and watch the... There's power in the name. There's power in the name. The name of Jesus. Isn't it amazing how people blasting his name so easily these days? This is not a coincidence. Satan has turned the name of Jesus into a curse word, an idle word, a word that is so frequently used with such irreverence that few take his blessed name seriously anymore. Have you noticed? How often do we stay silent when his name is misused? Why don't people use Gandhi's name or Buddha's name as a curse word? How come no one ever says, oh my Gandhi, or oh Buddha? They don't do that. And I'll tell you why no one misuses Muhammad's name, because his followers take his name seriously and they'll cut off your head. You know what's so amazing is that this lame beggar, it's so amazing about this beggar being healed. He had no faith. Doesn't say anything that he had faith. He wasn't expecting it. He wasn't asking for it. God sovereignly healed him by his own sovereign will. Remember that the next time you hear those charlatan health and wealth 
preachers on TV tell you that you aren't healed because you do not have enough faith. No, you don't even need faith to get healed. You got to believe that there's a God, but even then you don't have to believe. But since you're Christian, it's probably a good idea you believe in God, right? And you probably ought to believe that Jesus can heal. So what I say is if you're praying for something that's impossible, pray believing. You have two choices. Example, Saluna. We can pray unbelieving, oh Lord, if it's your will, oh God, please heal her if you will, oh God, please if it's your will. Or you say, God, in the name of Jesus, heal her. We're going to pray that she is getting healed. You have two choices, right? Pray unbelieving or pray believing. What do you think works for you better? Pray believing. And if the prayer doesn't get answered, you pray believing God. God just said no, that's all. Pray believing Pray Susanna gets a million dollar house to sell. And that she sells it. Pray Joe gets a $10 million house to sell. Pray that Gary gets a $20 million house to sell. Where's Carlette? And a 30 million. We have so many. We don't have enough wealth in Texas for our realtors. Because I'm praying believing. This man's healing is similar to a 2018 story in global prayer digest listen pastor chagan john invited us to accompany him to a mevasi Koli wedding when he arrived he asked to see the bride so he could pray for her when he found that the bride was not the oldest daughter he asked why she was being married first since that was the custom among these people they told us the sad story about her older sister rudy who was crippled for the last six months she had a disease and couldn't walk they had she couldn't walk. They had taken her to the best doctors and had bought the best charms and amulets to heal her, but to no avail. But they said they were welcome to pray for her. Rudy was brought out to this open room and placed on a mat in the center. We began praying for her. Suddenly, Pastor Chagan said to Rudy, stand up and walk. We were very amazed at this. What if she couldn't walk? As Pastor Chagan took her hand, she stood up and began walking, and people asked us to pray for them as well. As a result, Rudy and her family were baptized. There are about 30,000 Mevasi Kolis, but only about 20 believers among them. Perhaps God will use this miracle to bring many more to him. Verse 8, he jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. This man was happy as you would be too if you were crippled for so long. What does that look like? Well, I was walking over to this side of the church last week and I saw Tyler parked his bike there. He was totally unaware and he was sitting there parking his bike, just pay, doing what a little kid does, you know, not paying attention to anything. And, and I snuck up to the door and I banged the door open and go, boo! And Tyler did this. He did a straight up, that's what this guy looked like. Man, Tyler and I, we laughed, and that was so much fun. Isaac Walton said, God has two dwellings, one in heaven and the other in a thankful heart. Are you still excited about the fact that you are saved? Do you ever just spontaneously, when awaking in the morning, say, thank you, Jesus, thank you for saving me? There was an English Salvation Army drummer who beat his drum so hard that the band leader had to tell him to pipe down a bit and not make so much noise. In his Cockney accent, the drummer replied, God bless you, sir. Since I've been converted, I'm so happy I could bust the blooming drum. Are you that happy about your salvation? Have you ever blurted out, praise the Lord while doing the dishes or burst into song in the middle of the day simply because Jesus loves you and this you know because the Bible tells you so? Have you lost the joy of your salvation? Have you ever had it? Then pray like the psalmist prayed. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. The former lame beggar was walking and jumping and praising God. And look what happened next, verses 9 and 10. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. That's amazing. 
when someone gets saved and what God can do. And this account is a wonderful illustration of what salvation looks like. The man was born lame, just as all of us are unable to walk in a manner pleasing to God. Our father Adam passed on his lameness to all his descendants. He was also poor, just as we are spiritually bankrupt and have nothing to offer God, owing instead to him a great debt. The beggar was outside the temple, far from God, just as all people are separated from him because of our sin. But the man was healed solely by the grace of God, and his healing was immediate. We are also saved by God's grace, and healing is immediate. The miraculous healing pointed to Jesus and the work of his Holy Spirit, not to Peter, not to any man. Every miracle should point to the Savior, even as our lives should. I'm going to close with this story about Leonardo da Vinci, who had just finished his portrait of the Last Supper. He introduced a friend to inspect the work privately and give his judgment regarding it. Exquisite, exclaimed the friend. That wine cup seems to stand out from the table as solid, glittering silver. In response, the artist quietly took a brush and blotted out the cup, saying, I meant that the figure of Christ should first and mainly attract the observer's eye and whatever diverts attention from him must be blotted out. May our lives be lived for Christ's glory. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love, your healing. Thank you for your marvelous plan in your believers' lives. And thank you for those who have yet to come in, who are still outside the temple, who are still far away from you because you have a plan and a purpose for them. That is, that they would turn to you and give up all of their past life like that beggar. That beggar did not look back and go, oh, I love those days that I couldn't walk. Love those days I had to be dependent on others. No, Lord, you did a great healing in that man's life. And we are so thankful, God, for those examples that what you do, you do well. And you save to the uttermost. Thank you, Lord God, that we believe in you and we trust in you. And there are still many in here who still need to come to you, Lord. Draw them with your cords of loving kindness. Let them taste and see that the Lord is good. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done what you continue to do, and we look forward to your healing power being stretched out all over all of Johnson City, then to the rest of Texas and into the world. Yes, God, start here. Yes, God, help us to be vessels used for your glory. As I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.